Probability is an important tool in machine learning. We expect that you have been taught probability theory already, but since it's a subtle concept with complicated foundations, we'll go over the basics again in this video. To start, let's look at the way we use the word probability informally. Let's say you are a concerned parent, you read this headline, and you are shocked by it. You turn to your partner and you say, that means that the probability that our son is gambling online is 12.5%. Your partner disagrees. You have a good handle on your son's behavior and on his spending, unless he has a credit card you don't know about, and the probability of that is much lower than 12.5%. Well, then the probability that Josh, his closest friend, gambles online must be 12.5%. If one in eight boys is gambling, then they must be hiding somewhere. Your partner disagrees again. Probability doesn't enter into it. Josh is either gambling or he isn't. Clearly, we need to look at what we mean when we say that a probability of something is such and so. There are two commonly accepted ways of looking at it. Objective and subjective probability. We'll start with objective probability. In objective probability, the probability that X is the case represents an objective truth. Whatever a probability is, it must be the same for everybody. You and I may disagree over a probability, but only if one of us is wrong. There is only one true probability. The most common form of objective probability is frequentism. Under the frequentist definition, probability is a property of a hypothetical repeated experiment. For instance, take the statement, the probability of rolling six with a fair die is one in six. The experiment is rolling a die. The outcome we are discussing is the roll resulting in a six. If we were to repeat the experiment a large number of times, n, then the proportion of times we observe the discussed outcome is close to one in six. More precisely, as n grows, the proportion converges to one in six. Under a frequentist interpretation, saying the probability is one in six is equivalent to saying, if I roll the die repeatedly, the relative frequency of sixes will converge to one in six as the number of rolls grows. Note that this is an objective notion of probability, because if we both agree on how the experiment works, then we cannot disagree on what the probability is. Under objective probability, the statement, the probability that Josh is gambling is 12.5%, is indeed nonsense. There is no experiment we can imagine where Josh turns out to be a gambler one in eight times. Either he gambles or he doesn't. What we can say is that the probability that a teenage boy drawn randomly from the European population gambles online is 12.5%. This is an experiment we can repeat, and at every repetition we choose a different boy, so we get a different outcome. We should also note that our statement is not precisely correct. The actual probability is a number we don't know. This is what happens in practice. The probability of x happening is p. We don't know p, but we do know that there is some experiment for which the proportion of successful trials converges to a p with repeated trials. We repeat a large number of such trials, check the proportion of times p has happened, and use that as an estimate of the true probability p. That is also what happens in the research behind this article. We don't know precisely how many teenage boys gamble online, so the researchers found a way to estimate the total proportion. But it's unlikely that they checked every single boy in Europe. The alternative to objectivism is subjectivism. It states that probability expresses our uncertainty. If x is a Boolean variable, one that is true or not true, and we are uncertain whether x is true, then we can assign a probability to x being true. A probability of 0.5 means we are entirely ambivalent, and a probability of 0.75 means we think x is pretty likely to be true. A probability of 1 means we're entirely sure, with no room for doubt. In this case, under this interpretation, different people can have different probabilities for the same thing being true. You and I may disagree and both be right. If you have information I don't have, your probability may be closer to certainty than mine. Bayesianism is the main form of subjective probability. It builds on Bayes' rule, which we will discuss later, to tell us how we should use observations to update our beliefs. Under subjectivism, 
We can say the probability that our son is gambling is 12.5%. We don't know exactly what he gets up to, so even though there's a definite objective answer, we are uncertain. If we only know this headline, we may well pick 12.5% as our belief that our son is gambling. Of course, as noted before, we have a lot more knowledge about our son than about other teenage boys. We know he goes to bed on time, we know where he gets his money, and we know that he probably doesn't have a secret credit card. So even though the probability for a random teenage boy would be 12.5%, the probability for our own son is probably much lower because we have extra information. Note that Bayesianism, in some sense, encompasses frequentism. We are uncertain about the outcome of some experiment, which we can express as a Bayesian belief, and if we understand the experiment properly, then that belief will coincide exactly with the probability that a frequentist will assign to the outcomes. Bayesianism just extends the definition to allow for personal beliefs that are not objectively true. So at heart, subjectivism and objectivism are disambiguations. The word probability is ambiguous, and these allow you to make precise what you mean. Note that you don't have to commit to one view or another. At heart, subjective and objective probabilities are just ways to be more precise about what the word probability actually means. You can use the subjective definition one day and the objective definition the next, especially in informal settings. However, once you start doing statistics, the two definitions lead to fundamentally different approaches, which we'll see in more detail later. And in the statistical community, there are definitely two camps, the frequentists and the Bayesians. Since machine learning is often seen as another form of statistics, you may well ask whether it is usually seen as using subjective or objective probability. I can't give you a commonly accepted answer, I think opinions differ. My personal view is that machine learning, while being statistical in nature, is not fundamentally probabilistic. The fundamental principles of machine learning can be defined and explained without recourse to probability theory and indeed we have done so for most of the start of the course. The fundamental goal of machine learning, or at least of offline machine learning, is to minimize test set loss given only a training set, and some hints as to the relation between the two datasets. Of course, even if machine learning is not fundamentally probabilistic, probability has proven to be a very powerful tool, much like linear algebra and calculus, in helping us solve the problems of machine learning. The consequence, in my view, is that we can borrow whatever methods are most helpful to us at the time. We use the frequentist methods when we need them, and the Bayesian methods when they prove most helpful. We'll even, at times, mix the two in a single model. All of that was about the interpretation of probabilities. The mathematical definition of probability, studied in the field of probability theory, is entirely distinct from the question of what the definition of probability is when we apply it to the real world. Both frequentists and Bayesians use the same mathematical framework to express probability as a number between 0 and 1. The only difference between them is in what this number is taken to express. We'll go through the basic ingredients of probability theory quickly. These include the sample space, the event space, a probability function, and the use of random variables. The sample space is a set and the elements of the sample space are the single outcomes or truths that we wish to model. If we flip a coin, our sample space is the set of the two outcomes, heads and tails. If we roll a die, the sample space contains the six numbers on the six faces of the die. If we roll two dice, then our sample space contains 36 elements, each one a pair of two numbers. We can have discrete sample spaces, like these, or continuous ones. An experiment like measuring somebody's height is best expressed with a continuous sample space, such as all the real values. Note that discrete sample spaces do not necessarily need to be finite. We can have discrete infinite sample spaces. Consider, for instance, the experiment where we flip a coin and count how many flips it takes to see tails. In this case, any number of flips is possible, so the sample space is the natural numbers, although any number larger than 20 will get an astronomically small probability. Next up is the event space. 
we construct this from the sample space. Events are those things that can have probabilities. These include the elements of the sample space, like the probability of rolling a 6 with a die, but they also include sets of multiple elements from the sample space, like the event of rolling a 1 or a 6, and the event of rolling an even number. Even the empty set and the set of all 6 numbers are events in the case of rolling a die. As we will see, these will get probability 0 and 1 respectively. How the event space is constructed is a technical business. For our purposes, we can simply say that if the sample space is discrete, then the event space is the power set of the sample space, the set of all possible subsets that we can make. For continuous sample spaces, not every subset can be an event. Here we actually need to make sure that our event space is something called a sigma algebra. Random variables are a way to describe events. Their definition is confusing and a little convoluted, so we'll just give you an intuitive interpretation. We can think of a random variable d as something that takes the values in the sample space. We can then use this random variable d to describe events, such as d equals 4, larger than 3, or d is even. We can then assign a probability to each event with a probability function p. This function must satisfy several constraints, but we'll take those as red for now and just say that it takes as its input an event and produces as its output a value between 0 and 1. In machine learning, it's common to model features, target labels, and sometimes even model parameters as random variables. If we are referring to a data set of multiple instances, we model each of these as a separate random variable, but drawn from the same distribution. Interpreting what a statement of a probability function means depends on whether all variables are filled in. Here in the first line, x equals 0 refers to a single well-defined event. So p x equals 0 refers to a single value between 0 and 1. In the second line, however, we have a normal variable x. So the statement capital X equals lowercase x can refer to different events depending on what x is. In other words, here, p x equals x is a function of lowercase x. For example, if x can take values 0 and 1, it may refer to a simple function like the one shown below. Since we usually know which outcomes belong to which random variables, p capital, both p capital x and p lowercase x can be used as shorthand for p x equals x. Note that in these cases, lowercase x stands for some specific value, and uppercase x stands for the random variable. One important pitfall to be aware of, when we look at the events of a sample space in the discrete case, we see that they have probabilities. For instance, the probability of rolling a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6 are all 1 in 6 in the case of a fair die. But the same cannot be said in cases where we have a continuous sample space. So here we see a familiar drawing of a normal distribution. And the horizontal axis here is the sample space of this probability function. Now if I ask you which number has the highest probability, 0, under this distribution here, you may be tempted to answer that 0 has a higher probability, because that's where the function peaks. This is not the case. Both 0 and 1 have a probability 0 as in fact does every single element of the sample space. Every single number on this real line has probability 0. The only things that have non-zero probability are intervals. So we can say the interval from 0 to 1 has a higher probability than the interval from 1 to 2. The point 0 only has a higher probability density than the point 1. That's what this blue line expresses, the probability density, which we integrate to get the probability. This is important, because probability densities can have values larger than 1, and probabilities can't. So now that we have the basic language of probability theory in place, we can look at some of its most important concepts. We will quickly review the five concepts given here. Joint probability, marginal probability, conditional probability, independence and conditional independence, and Bayes' theorem.
we use a running example to illustrate these basic concepts of probability, which is the following. We sample a random person from the Dutch population and we check their age and the health of their teeth. We bin the results into three categories for each variable. We want to ask questions like, what is the probability of seeing an old person? What is the probability that a young person has fake teeth? And does a person's age influence the health of their teeth? Or is there no relation? The sample space, in this case, is the set of the nine different pairs of values we can observe. And the event space is the power set of that. The random variables, age and teeth, will help us describe these events. The joint distribution is the most important distribution. It tells us the probability of each atomic event, each event that contains a single element in our sample space. Since we have two discrete random variables in our example, we can specify the joint distribution in a small table. Each cell in this table represents an element of our sample space, an atomic event, and the probabilities of these nine events sum to one. Note that the function at the top, where we specify that we are interested in the event where the age is old and the teeth are healthy, refers to a single value between 0 and 1, specifically 1 over 18, because we have specified the event. The function below that, where age and teeth are not specified, does not refer to a single value because the variables are not instantiated. It represents a function of two variables, specifically the function defined by this table. If we want to focus on just one random variable, all we need to do is sum over the rows or columns. For instance, the probability that age equals old, regardless of the value of teeth, is the probability of the event old and healthy plus old and unhealthy plus old and false. Because we can write the sums of these in the margins of our joint probability table, this process of getting rid of a variable is also called marginalizing out as in we marginalize out the variable t. The resulting distribution over the remaining variable is called a marginal distribution. We sum the joint probabilities for all values of one of the random variables, keeping the value of the other fixed. In more general terms, for a joint distribution pxy, we can express the marginal probability with a capital sigma notation iterating over all possible values of y. The conditional probability is the probability over one variable if the value of another variable is known. If we know that somebody is young, for instance, and we know that the probability of them having false teeth must be much lower than it is on average. The conditional probability, px given y, is computed by taking the joint probability of x and y and normalizing by the sum of the probabilities in the row or column corresponding to the part that's given in the conditional. You can imagine throwing darts at this table and the probability of hitting a certain cell is the joint probability indicated in the cell. Then the conditional probability of f given y is the number of darts we find in the yf cell divided by the total number of darts in the y row. Here's what the conditional probability looks like in symbolic terms. In the numerator, we indicate one cell in the joint probability table, and in the denominator, we sum over all of the cells in one of the rows or columns. Now note that the denominator is just a marginal probability, summing over one of the rows or one of the columns. So if we replace this sum by the more concise notation of the marginal probability, we get this definition of conditional probability. And if we rearrange this, we get this equation, which we'll see a lot of. So this is useful to remember. The joint probability of x and y is the probability of y times the conditional probability of x given y. Here's what these concepts look like with continuous random variables, a bivariate normal distribution in this case. The joint probability distribution you can think of not as a table, but as a coloring of the plane. And marginalizing out either variable results in a univariate normal distribution, the blue and the red distributions respectively. The conditional distribution 
corresponds to a vertical or horizontal slice through the joint distribution and also results in a univariate normal distribution. If two variables x and y are independent, then knowing y will not change what we know about x. One way to define this is by saying that we can compute the joint distribution by multiplying the two marginal distributions. And with a little rewriting, we can see that this implies that the probability of x given y is equal to the probability of x. Conditional independence, conditional independence means that the two variables are dependent, but their dependence is entirely explained by a third variable z. If we condition on z, the variables become independent. Conditional independence comes up a lot, and it can be tricky to wrap your head around at first. So here's an example. Imagine two people who work in different areas of a very big city. In principle, they work so far apart that whether or not they arrive home in time for dinner is completely independent. Knowing whether Alice is late for dinner tells you almost nothing about whether Bob is late for dinner. No aspects of their lives, like weather or traffic, intersect in a meaningful way except one. Very rarely, a large monster attacks the city. In that case, all traffic shuts down and everybody is late for dinner. This means that if we know that Bob is late for dinner, there is a very slight chance that it's because of the monster, which should very slightly raise the possibility that Alice is late for dinner. However, once we know whether or not the monster has attacked, then knowing that Bob is late for dinner gives us no additional information about whether or not Alice is late for dinner. In other words, these two events are conditionally independent, conditioned on whether or not a monster has attacked the city. The final subject that we need to cover is Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule is a solution to the inversion problem, which we can state as follows. It's often easy to express the probability of observing something given some hidden cause, assuming that we have a decent model of the world. However, we usually want the opposite. We usually know what we've observed, but we don't know what the cause was. So we want to work out the probability of the cause given the observation. This is how Bayes' rule is usually written. We'll look at where this comes from a little later, but first let's look at an example. Let's say that we observe that Alice is late for dinner and we observe nothing else. We forget about Bob for this example. Does this tell us anything about whether a monster has attacked the city? It doesn't tell us much, because it's extremely rare that a monster attacks the city, so it's almost certain that Alice is late for other reasons. Still, if Alice were on time, we'd know that a monster couldn't possibly have attacked the city, since that would almost certainly make her late. So we may not know much, but we do know something. In this case, it's easy for us to work out the probability that Alice is late given the monster attack, the probability PA given M. This is usually the case when the conditional is the cause of the observable. In this case, Alice being late is caused by the monster attacking the city. And the opposite is usually what we're interested in, since we have the observable and we want to reason about its cause. And that's where Bayes' rule comes in. So let's say that we know the probability that we observe Alice being late, given that the monster attack happened, is somewhere near 1. Bayes' rule tells us how to calculate the opposite conditional, that of the monster attacking the city given that Alice is late, and this is not near 1. The reason it's not near 1 is because we multiply it by the marginal probability of a monster attack, which is really low. We then divide by the probability of Alice being late in general. The more likely Alice is to be late due to other causes, the lower the probability is that it is caused by a monster attack. Here is a good way to think about Bayes' rule. If there are three possible reasons for Alice to be late, traffic, monster, or snowfall, then we can see the denominator as a sum, marginalizing out the cause for Alice's lateness. If we look at how much the middle term contributes to the total of the sum, that proportion is what Bayes' rule gives us, the probability that Alice's lateness is caused by a monster attack. To understand the influence of the denominator here, Consider the situation where both traffic and snowfall are far more likely than a monster attack, so PT and PS are much higher than PM, 
but neither the traffic nor the snowfall ever calls Alice to be late, perhaps because she cycles home from work and has a bike with good snow tires. In that case, the conditional probability of Alice being late given that there is traffic and the conditional probability of Alice being late given that there is snow are both zero, so the first and the last term in the sum both become zero. And despite the fact that monster attacks are really rare, we can still conclude that a monster has attacked if we notice that Alice is late for dinner. And finally, note that if we start with the definition of conditional probability, then filling in the equation from slide 21 into the numerator directly leads to Bayes' rule. This doesn't mean that Bayes' insight was a simple one, only that it gave us both conditional probability and Bayes' rule, and they are very much two sides of the same coin. This concludes our review of the basic concepts of probability. If this is the first time that you've seen these concepts, then it may be wise to look into them a little bit more beyond this video. There are some recommendations for resources to help you do that on the Canvas suggested reading page. In the next video, we'll look at how we apply these principles to help us build machine learning models.